thank you all for coming today. My name is Caitlin O'Donnell. I'm the entomologist at Norfolk County Mosquito Control District. We're um, right down the street in Walpole. That's where our office is, but Norfolk, the town, is one of our uh, member towns. We have 25 communities that we serve. Um, so I'll talk today a little bit about mosquitoes and ticks, how to protect yourself, and then just some of the things that our organization does. So we'll start off with mosquitoes, and then at the end, I'll go over some um, information on ticks. So the big question first that we'll ask is why do we have mosquito control? And the answer is really because mosquitoes have caused more than half the deaths in human history. So mosquitoes carry a lot of different types of diseases. It's something that we are very concerned about and want to know how to protect ourselves against these different types of diseases. So how do we effectively protect ourselves and control mosquitoes so that we don't have to worry about these types of diseases? Well, first we have to know as much as we can about the organism in question. We have to know as much as we can about mosquitoes so that we can effectively control them. And what I wanna point out here is that within the family Culicidae, which is all mosquitoes, there are 41 genera, and there are over 3,500 known species of mosquitoes. They're a very diverse group of organisms. Of these 3,500 known species, only a few hundred vector diseases, and even fewer actually bite humans. So when we talk about mosquito control, we're really focusing in on specific species that are affecting us. And the rest of the species, we don't really um, have to concern ourselves with because maybe they only bite amphibians and they're not going to vector diseases or maybe they're really not interested in biting us um, at all and they feed on birds or they don't live in the right habitat where we'll even come into contact with them. So there are a lot of different um, things that you need to know about each species so that you know where they're going to be, who they're biting, um, and how to use that to your advantage. So in Massachusetts, we have over 50 species. So you think in the northern regions especially, oh, there aren't as many species of this insect because it's colder here, we just don't have the diversity that they do farther south, but we actually do have quite a large number of mosquito species. And I have some pictures of some interesting ones here. Um, this large one on the left, the common name is the elephant mosquito because its proboscis has this big curve like an elephant's trunk. It's one of our largest mosquito species and it actually doesn't take a blood meal at all. It doesn't need blood to survive. They drink nectar and they're pollinators as adults. And the larvae actually eat other types of mosquito larvae. So that's a really good mosquito to have around. That's one that we really want. Over here we have Uranotinia saffirina. It's a very small mosquito and has this very bright blue markings on its body. They're very pretty to look at under the mic microscope. And it's metallic, so it shines if you move it around. They only feed on worms. So you don't think of a worm as being a good meal, right? But this species of mosquito only takes blood meals from different types of worms. So that's another species we don't really need to worry too much about. Down here, I have two that we very much need to worry about. Cochlotidia perturbans is our most common um, abundant mosquito in the summer. They peak right around the 4th of July when everyone wants to be outside having barbecues, enjoying their yards. They love people and they feed at dusk. So as soon as the sun starts to set and you're trying to enjoy a nice evening on your porch, that's when they come out and they're really looking for some mammal blood. They love humans. Um, we have traps for them in Norfolk County, especially, or in Norfolk, the town especially, because they're called uh, the cattail mosquito. So their habitat is cattail swamps. And if you've noticed driving around the town, there's a lot of different um, areas where there's a lot of cattails. So that's where they're coming from. On the far right, on the bottom, is Ochlorotatus solicitans. That's one that you don't need to worry about in this town as much, but it's the salt marsh mosquito. So in our communities on the coast, in Quincy and Weymouth, they have really high numbers of these, depending on the tides and any flooding in those salt marsh areas. And they are another very aggressive human biter. So all of these different mosquito species have different, you can almost say, personalities. They like to eat different things, they behave, they're active at different times of the day, and these are really important things to know when you want to try and avoid or control mosquitoes. 
You also need to know a lot about the mosquito life cycle. So mosquitoes spend three out of their four life stages in the water. They're reliant on standing water in order to survive. So that's why when we talk about protecting yourself, we're always talking about looking for standing water sources on your property and dumping them out, making sure there's no mosquito larva in there. And I did bring some show and tell items, so we can look at this later, but I have some live mosquito larva in this cup here, just so you can familiarize yourself and make sure you know what they look like. So mosquitoes, we'll start with the egg stage. Mosquitoes start their life cycle as an egg. Depending on the species, they're laid in different types of habitats and in different ways. Here you see these single long ovals. Those will be laid on some sort of surface like leaves on the ground, inside of a tire, somewhere that will eventually become flooded with water. And those eggs sit and wait until that water inundates the area, then that's their signal to hatch. Other mosquitoes lay eggs in rafts like this. So one of these rafts can hold 100 to 200 eggs. So that's going to produce a lot of mosquitoes. They lay them on the surface of the water. So these mosquitoes are laying eggs really more when it's hot outside in the heat of the summer when there's um, water that is going to stick around so that those, that egg raft can be laid and hatch and develop into the adult. After the egg stage, they develop into their larval stage. This is um, what a lot of people will call wrigglers, is another word that people will use. And they spend, depending on the time of year, anywhere from just a few days to a few weeks in their larval stage. They go through four different stages of development. So they start out really tiny. You can almost barely see them. They're see-through um, because they're brand new and haven't fed on anything and haven't kind of let their bodies harden a little bit. Then they progressively get a little bit bigger with each stage as they're eating their filter feeders, as they're eating and living in this um, standing water environment. And you see these long tubes here and they're kind of hanging down from the surface of the water. They use those tubes to breathe and to balance at the surface. So they're able to take advantage of really gross habitats that don't have a lot of oxygen in them. So like a really muddy, ditch next to the side of the road, um, places where you wouldn't think that something would really like to live. After they go through their four stages of larval development, they develop into the pupil stage. So this stage is kind of, it's just like a um, cocoon or chrysalis that a caterpillar goes through in order to become an adult moth or butterfly. So they go um, into this pupa and they're rearranging their whole body inside of that shell to go from looking like this to looking like this. So there's a lot of rearranging that has to be done. They have to grow legs, they have to grow wings, they have to change their mouth parts because they go from eating um, floating debris in the water to drinking blood. So there's a lot of changes that has to happen in that pupil stage. Once they're, they've completed the pupil stage, the um, back of the pupa will split open and then the adult will emerge onto the surface of the water. And I have a picture up here of a male versus a female mosquito. So the female mosquitoes are the only ones that bite us. The male mosquitoes don't need a blood meal. The females bite us because they need that high um, nutrient blood in order to produce their eggs. They need a lot of protein and a lot of nutrients. So the male mosquitoes really just fly around in search of a mate and in search of a sugar source, like nectar from a flower, in order to live long enough to um, procreate and then they die. So the females are the ones that we're really focused on and that we're worried about because they're the ones that bite us, they're the ones that vector diseases. Mosquitoes can take advantage of a lot of different types of habitats. Again, this depends on the species that we're dealing with but they can take advantage of just containers in your yard. They can be in an open marsh. Right now we're finding a lot in wooded um, pools. So this is a really common spring environment where I collected those mosquitoes from, where the snow and the ice melts, we get a lot of rain and the wooded, um, our wooded areas become flooded. <clears throat> they also use, um, Tires. There are certain species that will lay their eggs in tires, and once those tires fill with water after a rain, then they're able to um, hatch and develop. And the tires are 
advantageous for them because they trap a lot of heat. So the species that we are concerned about that uses tires is a southern species that's been slowly moving north and we're monitoring it to make sure that it doesn't become too big of a problem here. But the heat of those tires has allowed them to be able to survive the winters in Massachusetts, whereas it previously wasn't really able to because it's not as cold tolerant as our species. And they're adapted to different habitats because they are so small. So you see this, this is a famous photo in mosquito control um, world, this bottle cap that's full of 100 mosquitoes. So it's a tiny bottle cap that you'd find on something like this, and it can host that many mosquitoes. So they are small and can use that to their advantage. This photo down here is just a drop of water on a leaf with a mosquito pupa inside. So they can really survive in a lot of different areas. They can have very fast development. Insects are cold-blooded, and the hotter it is, the faster they develop. The colder it is, the slower they develop. And their eggs can be dormant until rainy season. So um, two summers ago, in 2021, we had our record high um, trap count for mosquitoes since I started and I think since the program started. We had 23,000 mosquitoes in one trap in one night, which is pretty amazing to see. And these were all mosquitoes that are um, a floodplain species. So we had had a few years of drought and all of a sudden we got all that rain from different hurricanes throughout the summer and the rivers flooded and all of this area that had previously been dry had water in it. And there were eggs that had been sitting there since our last big flooding outbreak in 2016 and 2013. And all of these eggs now finally were flooded with water and were able to hatch. So they can remain dormant for a long time and then take advantage of that inundation of water. And I like to include this, especially this time of year, because we do get a lot of calls with people um, asking for us to come out because they have a lot of mosquitoes, but a lot of times it's a case of mistaken identity. So right now there are a few adult mosquitoes that had overwintered as adults and are now kind of waking up as the sun starts to get stronger and as it warms up, but we have not really had our first emergence of mosquitoes for the season. So what I, when I talk about that, I mean all of the larvae that have newly hatched have not yet emerged as adults. So that usually happens a little bit later in the season, but we do get a lot of midges earlier than mosquitoes. So you'll see these clouds of flies that do really look a lot like a mosquito, but most of the time they're not going to bite you because most of the midges we have do not um, feed on people. There are a few types of biting midges, but they don't vector diseases, so we're not as concerned about them. And they have very short lifespans. They'll be gone within a week or two. Um, but we do have a lot of look -alike, mosquito look-alikes that people can um, see and then will call us because they're concerned that mosquitoes have come out. So the reason that um, I am here is to talk about the diseases that mosquitoes carry. They carry a host of different, of different diseases um, and they're also a big nuisance problem if they're in really high numbers and you're not able to enjoy your home or the area that you're trying to enjoy. Today I'll focus on West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis because those are the two diseases that we screen for in Massachusetts and the ones that we are most concerned about in our area. Um, these are two species that are non-native to the, to the US and we've been monitoring for them um, in Massachusetts. Aedes albopictus on the right is um, a black mosquito with that white stripe down its back. And both of these mosquitoes can carry all of these tropical diseases as well as West Nile virus. So, and they're very aggressive human biters. So that's why we're trying to monitor their spread. We do not have Aedes aegypti on the left yet, but we are looking for it as, um, as its range expands. But I like to just include a photo because um, we've only found one Aedes albopictus in our county. So we're on the lookout for it. If people see it, I just like people to be aware of what they look like. They are um, established in other areas of Massachusetts, but we've only found that one adult individual in our county so far. So we're really on the lookout for it to make sure we stay on top of its spread. So we'll go over a little bit about both West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis. Uh, West Nile virus is um, 
harbored in bir the bird population. So the birds are hosts to this virus. It does not always make them sick. If you remember when West Nile virus first emerged in 1999 there were, and in the early 2000s, there were a lot of bird deaths because it was a new virus to our area and all susceptible birds who um, contracted it would get sick and then it would, it would kill them. But now a lot of our bird population has immunity to this virus and they're able to be hosts and the virus replicates within the bird. Certain species aren't as affected by the virus either. So that's why it was able to persist even though there were a lot of birds that were dying. So the mosquito has to bite an infected bird and then bite us in order to pass it to us. If I have West Nile virus and a mosquito bites me, it will not be able to get West Nile from me and then pass it to somebody else. So it's hosted in the bird population and we are dead end hosts as mammals. Eastern equine encephalitis works much the same way. It's um, kind of sequestered in this host population. Again, it's birds for Eastern equine encephalitis. And then it's amplified by a mosquito vector. So how it works in Massachusetts is we have one species that loves to feed on birds and is in the right habitat to feed on all of these delicious um, songbirds. It builds the virus in the songbird population, and then we get a bridge vector that likes both birds and people. It bites a bird, it bites a person or a horse, and again, we are dead end hosts, and then that's when we start to see this virus in the population. So that's why a lot of times you don't start to see the um, press releases and the information about human cases until later in the summer. It takes a while for the virus, for both, both West Nile and Tripoli, e, it takes a while for that virus to build in the bird population before a mosquito bites an infected bird and then passes it to a human. So usually it's later in the summer. I have a graph here of cases, human cases, of both diseases in the state. So this is statewide. And two things I want to point out are that we have these two really big spikes of Tripoli activity. So the blue bars are Tripoli, red is West Nile. And these are um, the two original Triple E outbreaks in Massachusetts. So Triple E is endemic to Massachusetts. It was actually discovered here. Um, the Hockamock Swamp in Bristol and Plymouth counties is like the epicenter of where Triple E, um, I don't want to say began because it existed beforehand, but where we first became aware of it and people started studying it and monitoring it. Then we have West Nile virus showing up in New York City in 1999. And that is kind of what spurred um, the formation of these more organized mosquito control districts because we were trying to prevent the spread of West Nile virus. And you can see immediately after we have a spike in West Nile virus cases. And you can see it's really variable depending on the year. West Nile virus does really well in hot and dry summers and it is more of an urban disease. So you'll see a lot of cases come out of Boston and Worcester and other areas with higher populations and with um, a more urban environment. And you can see that we had another really high year in 2018 as well. Now that we know a little bit about the diseases, we'll talk a little bit about how we control mosquitoes and then how we protect ourselves from them. When we're trying to control mosquitoes, we use something called integrated pest management or integrated mosquito management. It's a really common practice used in agriculture, in public health, and what it really means is that we're using all of these different tools to control mosquitoes in the best way possible. So we use everything we know about them, and we use a lot of different tools, not just pesticides, in order to more effectively control them and reduce our reliance on pesticides. So for today, I'm going to focus on these three things because that's what I am responsible for at our county as the entomologist, surveillance, research, and outreach. So surveillance is a very important part of integrated pest management because we can't control them without knowing where they are in the environment. So we use a lot of different tools. We use different traps. Um, I like to include pictures of our traps because sometimes people will come across them in the environment and be concerned and not know what it is. We've had people call um, our gravid traps bombs before. We've had people be worried about things like that or they just won't know what it is and 
will steal some of the equipment. So I like to include this so that you know, and we have signs on everything. This is for um, disease monitoring and mosquito monitoring. So we trap adult mosquitoes all through the summer, and I identify them to species. We see how many we have of each species, and then any species that I'm concerned about, we will send to the state lab for testing. And that is where the virus testing and monitoring comes in. We have traps all over Norfolk County. We have at least two traps in every town. And the state, the Department of Public Health, will use that information that we give them um, in order to make the risk maps. So in the summertime, if you go on their website, you can see a risk map and your community will be color coded based on the risk of infection. So if you see a blue over Norfolk, which often it is, you'll see low, it'll mean low risk, and then they'll increase to moderate, high, and critical based on how many mosquito pools we're finding that have virus in them or nearby communities that have virus. So the state will take that information and create these maps for everyone to see. Research is also an important part of integrated pest management because we need to make sure that everything that we're doing to control mosquitoes is actually working, and we need to continue learning as much as we can about the species that we're concerned about. So we look at things like mosquito biology and ecology, habitat, disease ecology, efficacy of traps, and efficacy of our control methods. And we're always exploring new methods of control as well. And I love to do different outreach events so that I can report what we learn to the public and um, provide advice on disease prevention, how to control mosquitoes on your property, and how to protect yourself. So I have seen some of you at the Norfolk Health Fair in the fall and have done other health fairs and presentations as well. So again, that term, integrated pest management, we're using all of these tools in the toolbox. We're monitoring where the mosquitoes are and where the, disease, the diseases are. We're choosing the right intervention. So we have a lot of different options available to us. One big one that I'll talk about in a moment is source reduction. So getting rid of that standing water where mosquitoes are breeding. That's really the, the best way that we can control them. Um, and then we'll evaluate that intervention and then communicate any risks or um, findings to the public. So you can play a big part in integrated pest management yourself at home by doing resource reduction on your property. So mosquitoes, as I said, can take advantage of a wide range of different habitats. There are a lot that really kind of, you know, you wouldn't even think of. So um, fountains and bird baths are a big one, clogged rain gutters, the saucers under potted plants or water put out for pets, um, any toys or other containers that are left out that fill with water. So you wanna make sure that you're looking for these sources of water and removing the water source before you can start breeding mosquitoes on your own property. And it really can kind of sneak up on you, especially if we're having a lot of rain. Um, in the summer, it really only takes a few days for mosquitoes to lay their eggs and use that water source to develop into an adult. So you kind of have to be quick about it. As far as ponds and bird baths and things like that, as long as the water is moving, then you're good. You don't need to worry about um, emptying it out. So installing something that will keep that water moving. In ponds, it's also um, helpful to have fish in there because fish will uh, eat the mosquito larva and will kind of act as your own little control um, method. And it's also very important to protect yourself and use repellent and dress appropriately. So there are a lot of different options for mosquito repellent out there. Um, some of the EPA approved options are DEET, picaridin, and oil of lemon eucalyptus. I was saying earlier, I kind of switched over to using products with picaridin in it because it doesn't have that smell that DEET has um, and it doesn't feel as sticky when you spray it on your skin, but it's, uh, and it's just as effective, but DEET is also a very good option. And when it comes to using DEET, you really only need 20 to 30%. So they sell, some of the DEETs that they sell are, you know, 90%, 100%. You really don't need something that strong. You can use 20 to 30% and just reapply when it says to in the directions on the can and it's just as effective. Uh, it helps to wear loose-fitting long sleeves and pants, closed-toed shoes to protect your skin. Uh, you want to wear something looser because 
something that sits right on your skin, a mosquito can land and its proboscis can go through your clothing. It'll even go through jeans, I've found before. So you wanna make sure that it's a little bit looser so that they can't get that gra grasp and get close to your skin. And permethrin-treated clothing is a really, really good option as well. Because then you treat your clothes, you're not putting it on your skin, your clothes are good for multiple washes, and it'll help um, prevent mosquitoes and ticks from biting you. It is really, really effective for ticks. It's the best um, method for preventing ticks that I can see. Um, I like to include this photo from an NPR article in 2015 because they found they were testing all different types of mosquito repellents and they found that um, not after four hours but upon application, Victoria's Secret bombshell perfume was very a very effective mosquito repellent. So it's it was just kind of funny and interesting to me that they, um, they found some repellency with that perfume. It was at an ex extremely high dose. It's not an amount that you'd want to put on your body, um, but I found it very interesting. And I also encourage you to visit our website. We have a lot of different programs that we offer, and we also like to include a lot of information, especially current information on our website. If there's any new mosquito news, um, you can go there and look for it. We have some historic surveillance data if you're interested in looking at mosquito numbers in Norfolk County. It hasn't been updated uh, because we had some website changes over the past couple of years, but there is some historic surveillance data on there. You can go to this tab here that says service request if you need any mosquito management on your property. So right now what we're working on is visiting um, any standing water in the environment and we're treating it if we find mosquito larvae. So we will come out and if you have a large wetland nearby, we'll check it and then we will apply a product called BTI. It is a bacteria that kills only mosquito and black fly larvae. So this is one of our big springtime programs. This will begin on Monday of next week and we'll go um, through the spring as long as we're still finding mosquito larvae and there's still water in the environment. So that's what you can do right now. If you're interested in adult, um, adult aside spraying in the summer, we don't start until after Memorial Day. So you can call or go to our website later um, in May and request that. I have a yeah. Uh, last year I had a pest control company. It was quite expensive. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed fairly effective. And uh, I never really understood when they first and they came, what they actually were going to do. What we should, should, what we should be looking for our pest control company, I expect them to say, what are the things that we can expect them to say that would be a very effective? Yeah. Number? That's a tough one because the companies are all very protective of, they're, they're not very transparent about what they do and what products they're using, I've found. Um, so that is, that is kind of difficult. Um, they often will use a barrier spray, so they'll treat your the perimeter of your property and any vegetation and things. And that product is supposed to last for a few weeks and they usually have a schedule where they're, they'll come and it depends on the product and the company where they'll come every you know couple months and reapply, that kind of thing. So barrier and spray and then come from time to time come and respray? That's usually what I see. I've, um, I'm not really that familiar with exactly what they're doing and using. A lot of times after there are a couple companies that I've noticed after they've been by, there's a really strong, um, like almost fake pepperminty smell. So they might be using some sort of essential oils, um, but it depends on the company and they're not always forthcoming with what products they're using. I just want to kind of know what I should, what I, what I, what I should expect them to see yeah. that would be good because for the price they charge it. Like right. I say, they're, they're quite expensive. Yeah, yeah, they can be. So I guess if you thought it was effective, then that probably is a good sign. Um, I think it just kind of depends on what, you can ask what product they're using and a barrier spray would end in enthrin, so it could be bifenthrin, um, something along those lines. And you can even Google you know, the product. Make sure, ask, make sure they can say the word barriers. Yeah, yeah, I'd ask what it is. Um, and what those types of companies do is different from what we do in the summer. We do our truck mounted ULV spraying. So that is going to just treat from the street. We don't come and treat um, uh, yards. 
and it goes up into the air and is a very ephemeral product and it kills mosquitoes that are flying at the time, but it doesn't last in the environment. So we're not, um, it's not gonna prevent them from coming back. It's just gonna kill any that are flying at the time. So that's a lot of times for people will call with nuisance problems or we'll do that in response to a disease um, instance that we find. So that, that is different. To do aerial spraying? No, the state is responsible for aerial spraying and that has always been in response to a public health emergency. So in 2019 and 2020, we had triple E cases and they organized the aerial spraying for that. So that's not something that we do. And does every county, like you're talking about Norfolk County, do all the other counties do this similar thing? Similar, yeah. We are pretty much all the same for the most part in what we do. Um, and it's not always based on county lines, but much of the state is covered. So they're, um, the Bristol and Plymouth County each have one. Cape Cod has one. Um, Martha's Vineyard even has one, but they don't so much do control. They do a lot of monitoring. Um, Northeast has one, Middlesex, Suffolk, Worcester. Uh, and then the western part of the state is not as well covered, but there are two out there that do cover as many towns as they can. So. <clears throat> One quick question, do you charge to go out to No, them? so we're a government agency and we're um, taxpayer funded and um, yeah, it's all, all a public program. So like say I live on a pond, mm -hmm. is that being treated anyway or would I have to call and say pond treat? So ponds are not always going to be a mosquito producer, it's often the little um, pools that are coming off of it or streams that maybe are getting clogged because ponds have a lot of fish and other um, mosquito predators and they also don't love you know deep water they like a shallower um, uh, pool so we can come out and look at the surrounding area it may be included in our aerial program so we do the um, we do from a helicopter apply that BTI. So if that's what you were asking about aerial, then but in my mind that's a completely different thing because um, we're treating larvae and not adults, um, and it's applied directly to the water. It's not an area-wide spray, if you want to say. Um, so that could be part of our helicopter program that happens in late April, but you can still call and we will. If it's a part of that, we'll tell you, and if it's not, we'll come out and check it. And is there a way to tell when you're gonna be doing aerial, doing aerial spraying, like on it's, the website? It's usually on our website. Every town has to be notified, so we're always notified, and all of the police and fire departments are notified as well. Um, so a lot of towns will do a kind of like blast communication effort to tell people, but it depends on the town. Um, but it will be on our website, and that's really just based on the mosquito development throughout the season. So when the mosquitoes are at the right stage and the weather is good, that's when we do that. And we're really focusing on um, high producing wetlands in our county. So, yep. Um, we also do, this becomes suspended in the summer because we're very busy, but we do tire pickup as well. So if you have a tire that's off the rim, um, you can request that we pick it up for you and we'll dispose of it properly. The reason we started this program is because of those mosquitoes that use tires to breed. Um, and they've found that tire uh, tires are kind of how that Aedes albopictus, Asian tiger mosquito was being moved up through uh, the Northeast. So we're trying to reduce um, tires in the environment that can provide a breeding source for those mosquitoes. So that's the purpose of the program. And this, just for your information, is our spray schedule for the summer. So when we're doing adult um, treatments for adults from the trucks, this is our schedule. So Norfolk is every Monday. Unfortunately, last summer, I think, all of our holidays fell on Monday and we don't, we're not open on holidays. There were a lot of rain events on Mondays, so that is a factor. But Norfolk is on Mondays. If you request um, before noon on Monday, then we can put you on the list and we'll um, get to you for that night and you can call the week before as well. So just to review, it's important to protect yourself from mosquitoes. Um, there are a lot of things you can do. You can wear repellent, you can dress appropriately. Um, if you are seeing a lot of things in the news about West Nile virus, you can try and limit your activity outside at dusk and dawn and just be vigilant of any symptoms that might pop up. 
Um, larvicide requests are ongoing. We're going to start treating next week. And our adulticide ULV requests start uh, in mid-May. We always start spraying after Memorial Day. So now we'll briefly just go over um, some ticks. I know it's getting a little bit uh, close to the end here, but we'll go over a few different um, ticks that you should be aware of and diseases that they carry and how to protect yourself again. So our ticks of medical importance in our area are the deer tick or black-legged tick. That's the big one that everybody um, probably knows about because they carry Lyme disease as well as a few others that are we're concerned about. The dog tick is pretty common. You probably have seen a lot of those. Um, the woodchuck tick is very uncommon, but I've included it here because it does vector a disease that we are concerned about. Lone star tick is a new one. So I'll have a picture up there just so you can see what it looks like, because it's one that is established on Cape Cod, but we're, we are concerned about it getting up into the rest of the state. So just be on the lookout for that. And then brown dog tick is very uncommon in our area, but um, I've included it here. So we'll start with the deer tick or black-legged tick. <clears throat> It transmits Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and Powassan virus. Um, Lyme disease we're all concerned about. A lot of people have either experienced it themselves or know somebody who has. So it's something that we're really trying to <clears throat> prevent. But anaplasmosis and babesiosis have also been on the rise in our area over the past um, few years or so. So they've seen a lot more cases of those. Um, they've been doing, through the Red Cross, some screening for both of these to kind of get a handle on how, how many people are actually being affected by these diseases. Um, I donate blood a lot and platelets, and every time I go in, they always ask you to check, would you, you know, will you participate in this study? So they have been really screening um, blood samples for that a lot. And um, their range has expanded in recent years. Um, probably 20 years ago, you really didn't hear about Lyme disease very much, right? So um, the deer tick was in Massachusetts, but I did all my graduate work in Maine. And in Maine, it really didn't get up to the area where I was until um, just 10 years or so ago. And so people didn't really know that they had to look out for it. And doctors even were not as familiar with Lyme disease as they are down here. So its range really has expanded and its population has really exploded as well. We have a lot, a lot of ticks out there in the environment. Uh, they love forested habitats. So a lot of times you think about ticks and you see a meadow with tall grass and you think, oh, that, there's got to be a lot of ticks in there. But this particular tick does not like that type of habitat. So really you'll encounter them most along the sides of trails where there's a lot of leaf litter um, and low brush. They really like shaded environments. They are very resistant to, or they're very susceptible to drying. So they don't really like to be in direct sun. They don't like it to be too hot. They like to be in the shade in um, leaf litter or vegetation so that the moisture level is a little bit higher in their little area. And their hosts are small rodents and deer, but as we all know, they will also feed on humans as well. And down here is a picture from Tick Encounter, which is a really good resource um, through URI, where you can go on and look at photos of ticks in different stages of their life and in different stages of um, being fed on blood because their body will expand and they'll look very different. So down here we have the larval stage, Super tiny, very, very hard to see. I should have brought my card because um, I've found some on myself before and it's, it's really tiny. A freckle, less than a, a freckle. A yeah. That tiny larvae, can that bite? Yes, it can. Yep. And it can carry, yeah. It do, this stage does not carry disease as highly as the other stages okay. because it hasn't necessarily fed on the host for the, the bacteria, but it's possible. So if they've fed on a mouse and have, or a chipmunk and have picked up that bacteria, then they are able to transmit it. But a lot of times when I've experienced it, I've got a larva, like a freshly hatched larva on me. Yeah. Um, then you have the nymphal stage. So this is about the size of a poppy seed. Again, very tiny. And they're black, so it can look like a freckle. I have a lot of freckles, and when I do my tick check, I'm always, thrown off by a couple freckles on my shoulder. So um, then you have the adult stage, about the size of a sesame seed. Again, still pretty small, but a little bit easier to see. When they're feeding, they do get a lot bigger. Their um, abdomen expands, and you can see all the way on the right is a fully fed female, so really engorged um, body. 
And if you are bit and you're concerned, you can save your ticks and send them to be tested for diseases um, or save it and bring it to your doctor as well. That's a good way to deal with that. Does the, um, does the tick need to be embedded for a certain amount of time for it to transmit the disease? Yes. Um, so usually we say about 48 hours for Lyme disease, but it is kind of a spectrum. So it can, it can be transmitted sooner, but the chances of that are much lower. So after 48 hours, it's um, a lot more likely that it will have, have transmitted the disease. The other bacterial diseases, anaplasmosis and babesiosis, are transmitted much faster. So you still, if you get one on you and it has, has taken blood, you still do want to maybe, if not send it to, for testing, bring it to your doctor. And they can at least look at what species it is and kind of give you a test or, you know, an idea of what your risk might be. Um, and they, they do take a little while to decide to bite you. So if you are going outside and you do a tick check every day, you should be able to catch it before it has really attached and fed on you. So I'm, you know, out in the field every day and walking around and I maintain that ticks don't like me as much as mosquitoes do because I rarely get ticks on me. But when I do, um, they're usually still crawling and searching for a place to bite or they've just bitten and I'm able to take it off before. When, when's a bad time? Like, I always thought like in the cold weather, it's okay mm -hmm. when the woods is not clear out in the wooded areas, but I'm not very hesitant like this time. Even. When's the best time should you wait till the cold winter months is down up, you know, like 32 degrees or colder or something? Yeah. But what's the best time to attack those areas and clean up those wooded areas that probably have a lot of ticks? In yeah, them? I'll, I'll actually go over their life cycle okay. next. Uh, since you asked, there's the distribution. So it's pretty much all the east, east coast. But they have a very complicated life cycle. So when it's cold below freezing, they will not be active, but as soon as it's above freezing, they can be active and searching for food. Just because it's below freezing doesn't mean that they're not there. They just are kind of reserving their energy, resting while it's cold. They're very slow because they're cold blooded. So right now, yeah. it's that time to go and look yes. Like yes, so they'll be there. So they, they have a two year life cycle. Ticks will live for two years, which is kind of a long time for an, uh, um, an arthropod but they start as eggs and they're laid in the spring. Then they hatch into their larval stage and are feeding on small organisms throughout the summer, usually a rodent like a mouse or a chipmunk. And then they um, spend the whole first fall and winter in that larval stage. Then they develop into the nymph. And this is shaded because this is what is estimated to be the, high, the greatest um, danger for catching Lyme disease because the nymphs are small. Um, so it's harder to see and take them off of yourself before you've become infected. But they also have spent this whole time feeding on these white-footed mice that are one of the main reservoirs for Lyme disease. So then they spend their following summer in their nymphal stage and they are feeding on a, a broader range of hosts. So they start feeding on things that are a little bit bigger. They can be found on people. Then they um, develop into the adult stage the following fall. And that's when they're usually on deer. So that's um, usually they're spending their adult stage on deer. So even if you treat your yard and, and clear things away, which I'll go over in a few slides, um, if deer are running through, they could still be dropping ticks off. So it's something to just keep in mind. And then they spend the next winter as adults and lay their eggs and it starts all over again. So at any time of year, there's two stages of ticks going on because they live for two years. So they do have a little bit of a more complicated life cycle. Um, and they exhibit this questing behavior. So I had somebody say before um, asking about if they jump. A lot of people do think that, but they actually can't jump, but they do crawl up. So their instinct is to crawl upwards. And they'll crawl up something like a blade of grass, a twig, and then they'll reach their arms out and wave them around and wait for something to come by. And something comes by and they'll grab on and then they're off with you hitchhiking. So the dog tick is our other common species. You'll see a lot of these. These ones, um, they can transmit tularemia and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but for the most part, that's very uncommon in our area. So really dog ticks are not a big um, 
disease issue for us. If you get bit and you start to feel sick, it still is a good idea to save that tick and go to your doctor. But um, these ones we're not as concerned about for disease. And these ones do like that open field and trail habitat. So they are a little bit more resistant to drying out. They like a little bit hotter temperatures. They can withstand that direct sunlight. So they might be out in those open fields, whereas the deer ticks really don't like that type of habitat. And they feed on a large range of different hosts. And again, they're a, they're a bit bigger than deer ticks. So you'll usually be able to see them a little bit easier. And they have these white markings on their bodies. And their distribution is pretty much the whole eastern part of the country, plus California. Um, so woodchuck tick, I just included it. It's in the same genus as uh, the deer tick. It transmits Powassan. It really doesn't like to feed on people, but there have been some instances where um, people have come into contact with it. And Powassan is kind of a newer disease that we're seeing in the news a lot. So I just wanted to include that as well. It looks a lot like the deer tick, and same size, size of a sesame seed. Very similar. So the lone star tick, I do want to point out, um, it is established on Cape Cod, as I said, but it um, is likely moving northward and inward. So we just want to watch out for it. It's very distinctive. Um, it's kind of rounder than the other ticks, and it has this white spot on its back. That's how it got its name, <coughs> the lone star tick. So that white spot on its back. Um, they're very aggressive, and they don't do that sit and wait questing behavior. They will chase after you, and they're very fast for a tick. So they really behave a lot differently than other ticks do. And they carry a lot of different types of diseases. Um, the big one that we have been hearing about is the uh, red meat allergy. So some people who are bit by this tick will develop an allergy to red meat. Um, and it's really a an allergic reaction to a protein that the tick has in its saliva. Some people experience it, some people don't. Some people are able to um, get recover from this allergy after a while, some people aren't. So it's kind of a newer thing that people are looking into. Um, and they live in woodland habitats. They feed on a wide range of hosts. So just keep an eye out for these guys, especially if you have a house on the Cape or visit the Cape often, um, because they are down there. So. And their um, distribution is east, east coast. Um, and then the brown dog tick is very uncommon in our area. It's a lot more common in the south. But um, it looks different than our others. And so if you see a brownish tick that's a little bit bigger and looks kind of weird, you can always save it and call me or um, bring it to, send it to one of the tick resources as well. And they really prefer dogs as a host. So quickly, I'll go over personal protection from ticks. You want to wear repellent. As I said before, permethrin is the best um, repellent for ticks. And you can treat your clothing with it. And it's good for multiple washes. So if you have those clothes that you love to garden in or the clothes that you love to hike in, you want to treat your shoes, your socks, your pants. Treat your clothes um, and then retreat after a few washes. And the um, the product will give you instructions on how to use it. But permethrin, you do not want to put on your skin. You can buy clothes that are pre-treated um, as an option, but again, you can do it yourself. It's really important to do daily tick checks if you're going outside. So I do it every day when I get home from work. Um, just check yourself. I know it can be difficult because they are small, so they're hard to see. But if you can do your best to check yourself for ticks. It can really, really help, and you can save any ticks you find if you're concerned about disease. Um, a, a lot of places that they like to be are in armpits, behind the ears, um, anywhere where it's going to be a little bit warm and protected. Um, so that really is the best way to protect yourself. What about, but again, the um, pest control uh, companies? Uh, Last time they came, they said they, sp they were going to spray the perimeter of yep. the area. So that would be a barrier the whole, spray. The whole area. Yeah. But is that, would you say that's sufficient? I thought that was yeah. the same myself. Why aren't they spraying the whole darn thing? Yeah. You know, but they said they're going to do the perimeter, like 10 feet on one end or 10 feet on the other. Is that, does that sound reasonable to you? Yes. So I say, I say here for protecting your home, a barrier perimeter spray is very common for ticks. And that's because it's um, kind of creating a, a little oasis away from ticks. So they're, they're not gonna be able to cross. Yeah, 
they're not going to be able to cross that barrier and get into your yard from the woods. But as I said, if you've got deer running through their, your yard, they can drop ticks into your yard. Um, but this is from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. They have a, a lot of tick resources if you're interested. But this is something that they came up with um, to kind of help protect your home. And they want you to create a kind of tick zone and then a tick safe zone. So say you've got a house with this lovely large yard, you can create this barrier of wood chips three feet or wider that will prevent the ticks from crawling through because I said they don't like um, that heat and hot environment. The wood chips will dry them out. Wood chips? Yep. So if you have like a, you know, like it's, like it's a moat around your castle kind of thing. So a three feet wide strip of uh, wood chips and then anything that could be harboring ticks you keep on the other side so that any leaf piles that dense vegetation um, here's a wood pile which could harbor both ticks and their host mice and chipmunks and then on the other side of the tick zone which they suggest that you include a tick migration zone so m kind of mowed down grass um, that extends that barrier where if they're crawling through they can't quite make it because it's too hot, it's too dry. Um, they're not able to make it through. And then on the other side is where you have um, swing set, vegetable garden, um, anywhere else you want to enjoy, enjoy yourself. So that's kind of what they came up with. And you can tailor it to your own property. Um, but creating that barrier is the idea. And then the perimeter spray is the same idea, something that they're not able to cross. And these are a few resources. So if you do um, collect a tick and you want to know if it's carrying any diseases, you can send it to UMass Amherst or Tick Encounter. Um, I think Maine will accept them as well. This is a paid um, service. You have to pay for the testing. But if you're concerned about it, you can contact them and send it. And then they also have a lot of really good information on their website. So um, tick identification. They have ticks, photos of ticks in different stages. Um, it's a really good, a really good resource. And then the CDC always has a lot of information on both tick-borne disease and mosquito-borne diseases. What are the best types to that spray? The barrier spray? Yes. Please. Usually they, I think usually they do May. Yeah. I think that's usually the best time. So, yep. I've heard so many times that ticks are hard to take off of this. Yeah. They can be, yeah. It's, um, you want to grasp as close to the head as possible with tweezers and pull firmly out. If the head stays in, you don't need to con be concerned. Um, it will usually come out on its own, just like if you have a splinter. Uh, you just want to make sure it doesn't get infected, and then you'd want to go to your doctor. But you want to grasp as close as you can to your skin and pull out kind of along your skin firmly. It can be difficult, but... How do you kill them? Like if, if you find them crawling on your yeah, they yeah. like that hard outer shell. Yes, so they can be tough. You can kind of squish them if you've got nails, but um, yeah, they, they do have a very hard exoskeleton, so it's hard to squish them. You can't step on them like you could something else. Um, you can flush them down the toilet. You can put them in the freezer for a while. Um, a lot of people like to burn them, but I don't recommend that. Um, I actually save them because of my job, so I stick them on a piece of tape and put them on an index card. Um, but you can, can no, the tape, the tape sk sticks them down, yeah. So if you want to save one and bring it to your doctor, you can put it in a piece of tape and fold it, clear tape and fold it over. Then they'll be able to see what kind it is. Um, you can put it in a baggie, but freezer is good or flush it down the toilet. I have another question. Yeah. Um, you said for ticks it was um, a two-year lifestyle. What about mosquitoes? That depends on the species. Um, there are some really interesting mosquitoes that overwinter as larvae. So their eggs are laid the previous summer, and right now they've spent the whole winter in their larval stage. They'll come out as adults um, in the summer. So they'll have about a year of a um, life cycle length. But there are other mosquitoes that really only live a couple weeks, and then that's it. Where do the ticks nest when, you know, the is it in like a clump or is it all, do they? 
Um, you, will, you will find ticks in a clump when they've just hatched from an egg, a cluster of eggs. So if there's a bunch of eggs laid on the ground here, all those um, ticks will hatch. And so there'll be, you know, 100 larvae right in a little area. Um, but then they'll kind of spread out from there. And then they live on their own. They, um, yeah, they don't need to be with, I mean, until they're ready to mate. They're kind of just looking for their food source. There might be a couple ticks on one organism. Like if you have do a dog, you might find a couple ticks on your dog at once. But yeah, um, yeah they're, they're living their lives pretty much on their host. And if they're not on a host, they're looking for one until it's time to lay eggs. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, being vigilant about um, awareness of mosquito symptoms. Yeah. Can you go into those? Yes, absolutely. So um, for the most part, a lot of the diseases you'll get from mosquitoes will kind of feel like the flu. You'll have headache, fever, um, body aches, body fatigue. Um, you'll feel really tired. So it can kind of feel like another illness that you might have, but if you're feeling that way in the middle of the summer when it's not really flu season, it might be a clue that you should, um, you know, think about whether you've been exposed to mosquitoes or ticks. Um, but yeah, it's usually a fever, body aches, headache. I've been bitten twice. Mm -hmm. So what I do now is before I work in my garden, yeah. I take an old white sheet that I walk around yeah. with it. And the white attracts them and the movement attracts them. So I'm essentially Cleaning the ticks out of the area where I'm going to work. Mm -hmm. That's actually how we um, do tick surveys. It's called uh, flagging. So you take a white flag and drag it. And remember, we talked about the sit and wait. So they're sitting in your yard like this. And when the, the sheet goes over, they're going to attach to it. So yeah, you can, you can do that. It will help. Well, thank you very much, Kate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.